Chapter 8 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clerke. Part 2. Chapter 8. Planets and Satellites. Continued. Part 3. The curious phenomena attending Jovian satellite transits may be explained partly as effects of contrast, partly as due to temporary obscurations of the small disks projected on the large disk of Jupiter. At their first entry upon its marginal parts, which are several times less luminous than those near the center, they invariably show as bright spots then usually vanish as the background gains luster to reappear after crossing the disk thrown into relief as before against the dusky limb but instances are not rare more especially of the third and fourth satellites standing out during the entire middle part of their course in such inky darkness as to be mistaken for their own shadows the earliest witness of a black transit was Cassini, September 2nd, 1665. Romer in 1677 and Maraldi in 1707 and 1713 made similar observations which have been multiplied in recent years. In some cases, the process of darkening has been visibly attended by the formation or emergence into view of spots on the transiting body, is noted by the two bonds at harvard march eighteenth eighteen forty eight the third satellite was seen by dawes half dark half bright when crossing jupiter's disk august twenty one eighteen sixty seven one third dark by davidson of california january fifteenth eighteen eighty four under the same circumstances and unmistakably spotted both on and off the planet by schroeter Seshi, Dawes, and Lassell. The first satellite sometimes looks dusky, but never absolutely black, in traveling over the disk of Jupiter. The second appears uniformly white, a circumstance attributed by Dr. Spitta to its high albedo. The singularly different aspects, even during successive transits, of the third and fourth satellites are connected by Professor Holden with the varied luminosity of the segments of the planetary surface they are projected upon, and W. H. Pickering inclines to the same opinion. But fluctuations in their own brightness may be a concurrent cause. Herschel concluded in 1797 that, like our moon, they always turn the same face towards their primary, and as regards the outer satellite, Engelmann's researches in 1871 and C. E. Burton's in 1873 made this almost certain, while both for the third and fourth Jovian moons it was completely assured by W. H. Pickering's and A. E. Douglas's observations at Arequipa in 1892 and at Flagstaff in 1894 through 95. Strangely enough, however, the interior members of the system have preserved a relatively swift rotation, notwithstanding the enormous checking influence upon it of Jovi raised tides. All the satellites are stated, on good authority, to be more or less egg-shaped. On September 8, 1890, Barnard saw the first elongated and bisected by a bright equatorial belt during one of its dark transits, and his observation, repeated August 3, 1891, was completely verified by Schaeberl and Campbell, who ascertained, moreover, that the longer axis of the prolate body was directed towards Jupiter's center. The ellipticity of its companions was determined by Pickering and Douglas. Indeed, that of number three had long previously been noticed by Sashi. Number three also shows equatorial stripes, perceived in 1891 by Shea Burrell and Campbell, and evident later to Pickering and Douglas, 
nor need we hesitate to admit as authentic their records of similar though less conspicuous markings on the other satellites a constitution analogous to that of jupiter himself was thus unexpectedly suggested and vogel's detection of lines or traces of lines in their spectra agreeing with the absorption rays derived from their primary lend support to the conjecture that they possess gaseous envelopes similar to his the system of jupiter as it was discovered by galileo and investigated by laplace appeared in its outward aspect so symmetrical and displayed in its inner mechanism such harmonious dynamical relations that it might well have been deemed complete nevertheless a new member has been added to it near midnight on september ninth eighteen ninety two professor barnard discerned with the lick thirty six inch a tiny speck of light closely following the planet he instantly divined its nature watched its hurried disappearance in the adjacent glare and made sure of the reality of his discovery on the ensuing night it was a delicate business throughout the lilliputian luminary subsiding into invisibility before the slightest glint of jovian light and tarrying only for brief intervals far enough from the disk to admit of its exclusion by means of an occulting plate and the new satellite is estimated to be of the thirteenth stellar magnitude and if equally reflective of light with its next neighbor io satellite number one its diameter must be about one hundred miles it revolves at a distance of one hundred and twelve thousand five hundred miles from jupiter's centre and of sixty eight thousand from his bulging equatorial surface its period of eleven hours fifty seven minutes twenty three seconds is just two hours longer than jupiter's period of rotation so that phobos still remains a unique example of a secondary body revolving faster than its primary rotates jupiter's innermost moon conforms in its motions strictly indeed inevitably to the plane of his equatorial perturbance following however a sensibly elliptical path the major axis of which is in rapid revolution its very insignificance raises the suspicion that it may not prove solitary possibly it belongs to a zone peopled by asteroidal satellites more than fifteen thousand such small bodies could be furnished out of the materials of a single full-sized satellite spoiled in the making but we must be content for the present to register the fact without seeking to penetrate the meaning of its existence very high and very fine telescopic power is needed for its perception outside the united states it has been very little observed the only instruments in this country successfully employed for its detection are we believe dr common's five-foot reflector and mr newell's twenty-five-inch refractor in the course of his observations on jupiter at brussels in eighteen seventy eight mr neeson was struck with a rosy cloud attached to a whitish zone beneath the dark southern equatorial band its size was enormous at the distance of jupiter its measured dimensions of thirteen minutes by three minutes implied a real extension in longitude of thirty thousand in latitude of something short of seven thousand miles the earliest record of its appearance seems to be by professor pritchett director of the morrison observatory in the u s who figured and described it july ninth eighteen seventy eight it was again delineated august nine by tempel in florence in the following year it attracted the wonder and attention of almost every possessor of a telescope its color had by that time deepened into a full brick red and was set off by contrast with a white equatorial spot of unusual brilliancy during three ensuing years these remarkable objects continued to offer a visible and striking illustration of the compound nature of the planet's rotation the red spot completed a circuit in nine hours 
55 minutes, 36 seconds. The white spot in about five and a half minutes less. The relative motion was thus no less than 260 miles an hour, bringing them together in the same meridian at intervals of 44 days, 10 hours, 42 minutes. Neither, however, preserved continuously the same uniform rate of travel. The period of each had lengthened by some seconds in 1883, while sudden displacements, associated with the recovery of luster after recurrent fadings, were observed in the position of the white spot recalling the leap forward of a reviving sunspot. Just the opposite effect attended the rekindling of the companion object, while semi-extinct in 1882 through 84, it lost little motion. But a fresh axis of retardation was observed by Professor Young in connection with its brightening in 1886. This suggests very strongly that the red spot is fed from below. A shining aureola of faculae described by Bredichin at Moscow and by Losa at Potsdam as encircling it in September 1879 was held to strengthen the solar analogy. The conspicuous visibility of this astonishing object lasted three years. When the planet returned to opposition in 1882-83, through 83, it had faded so considerably that Rico's uncertain glimpse of it at Palermo, May 31, 1883, was expected to be the last. It had, nevertheless, begun to recover in December, and presented to Mr. Denning in the beginning of 1886 much the same aspect as in October 1882. Observed by him in an intermediate stage, February 25, 1885, when a mere skeleton of its former self, it bore a striking likeness to an elliptical ring, Descried in the same latitude by Mr. Gledhill in 1869-70, through 70. this indeed might be called the preliminary sketch for the famous object brought to perfection ten years later, but which Mr. H. C. Russell of Sydney saw and drew, still unfinished, in June 1876, before it had separated from its matrix, the dusky south tropical belt. In earlier times, too, a marking, at once fixed and transient, had been repeatedly perceived attached to the southernmost of the central belts. It gave Cassini, in 1665, a rotation period of 9 hours 56 minutes, reappeared and vanished eight times during the next 43 years, and was last seen by Maraldi in 1713. It was, however, very much smaller than the recent object, and showed no unusual color. The assiduous observations made on the Great Red Spot by Mr. Denning at Bristol and by Professor Howe at Chicago afforded grounds only for negative conclusions as to its nature. It certainly did not represent the outpourings of a Jovian volcano. It was in no sense attached to the Jovian soil if the phrase have any application to that planet, it was not a mere disclosure of a glowing mass elsewhere, seethed over by rolling vapors. It was, indeed, certainly not self-luminous, a satellite projected upon it in transit, having been seen to show as bright as upon the dusky equatorial bands. A fundamental objection to all three hypotheses is that the rotation of the spot was variable. It did not then ride at anchor, but floated free. Some held that its surface was depressed below the average cloud level, and that the cavity was filled with vapors. Professor Wilson, on the other hand, observing with the 16-inch equatorial of the Goodsell Observatory in Minnesota, received a persistent impression of the object being at a higher level than the other markings. A crucial experiment on this point was proposed by Mr. Stanley Williams in 1890. A dark spot moving faster along the same parallel was timed to overtake the red spot towards the end of July. A unique opportunity hence appeared to be at hand 
of determining the relative vertical depths of the two formations one of which must inevitably it was thought pass above the other no forecast included a third alternative which was nevertheless adopted by the dark spot it evaded the obstacle in its path by skirting round its southern edge nothing then was gained by the conjunction beyond an additional proof of the singular repellent influence exerted by the red spot over the markings in its vicinity it has for example gradually carved out a deep bay for its accommodation in the gray belt just north of it the effect was not at first steadily present a premonitory excavation was drawn by schwab and dessau september fifth eighteen thirty one and again by truvelo bernard and elvins in eighteen seventy nine yet there was no sign of it in the following year its development can be traced in dr burdick's beautiful delineations of jupiter made with a parsonstown three-foot reflector from eighteen eighty one to eighteen eighty six they record the belt as straight in eighteen eighty one but as strongly indented from january eighteen eighty three and the cavity now promises to outlast the spot so long as it survives however the forces at work in the spot can have lost little of their activity for it must be remembered that the belt has a shorter rotation period than the red spot which accordingly as mr elvins of toronto has pointed out breasts and diverts by its interior energy a current of flowing matter ever ready to fill up its natural bed and override the barrier of obstruction the famous spot was described by keeler in eighteen eighty nine as of a pale pink color slightly lighter in the middle its outline was a fairly true ellipse framed in by bright white clouds the fading continuously in progress from eighteen eighty seven was temporarily interrupted in eighteen ninety one the revival indeed was brief professor barnard wrote in august eighteen ninety two the great red spot is still visible but it has just passed through a crisis that seemingly threatened its very existence for the past month it has been all but impossible to catch the feeblest trace of the spot though the ever persistent bay in the equatorial belt close north of it and which has been so intimately connected with the history of the red spot has been as conspicuous as ever it is now however possible to detect traces of the entire spot an obscuring medium seems to have been passing over it and has now drifted somewhat preceding the spot the object is now always inconspicuous and often practically invisible and may be said to float passively in the environing medium yet there are sparks beneath the ashes a rosy tinge faintly suffused it in april nineteen hundred and its absolute end may still be remote the extreme complexity of the planet's surface movements has been strikingly evinced by stanley williams detailed investigations he enumerated in eighteen ninety six nine principal currents all flowing parallel to the equator but unsymmetrically placed north and south of it and showing scant signs of conformity to the solar rule of retardation with increase of latitude the linear rate of the planet's equatorial rotation was spectroscopically determined by Belopolsky and de la Sandres in 1895. Both found it to fall short of the calculated speed, whence an enlargement by self-refraction of the apparent disk was inferred. Jupiter was systematically photographed with the Lick 36-inch telescope during the oppositions of 1890, 1891, and 1892, the image thrown on the plates, after eight-fold direct enlargement, being one inch diameter. Mr. Stanley Williams' measurements and discussions of the set for 1891 showed the high value of the materials thus collected, although much more minute details can be seen than can at present be photographed. 
the red spot shows as very distinctly annular in several of these pictures recently the planet has been portrayed by delessandres with the sixty-two foot newton refractor the extreme actinic feebleness of the equatorial bands was strikingly apparent on his plates in eighteen seventy mr reynard whose death december fourteenth eighteen ninety four was a serious loss to astronomy acting upon an earlier suggestion of sir william huggins collected records of unusual appearances on the disk of jupiter with a view to investigate the question of their recurrence at regular intervals he concluded that the development of the deeper tinges of color and of the equatorial porthole markings girdling the globe in regular alternations of bright and dusky agreed so far as could be ascertained with epochs of sunspot maximum the further inquiries of dr losa at bothkamp in eighteen seventy three went to strengthen the coincidence which had been anticipated a priori by his owner in eighteen seventy one moreover separate and distinct evidence was alleged by mr denning in eighteen ninety nine of decennial outbreaks of disturbance in north temperate regions it may indeed be taken for granted that what hahn terms the universal pulse of the solar system affects the vicissitudes of jupiter but the law of those vicissitudes is far from being so obviously subordinate to the rhythmical flow of central disturbance as are certain terrestrial phenomena the great planet being in fact himself a semi-sun may be regarded as an originator no less than a recipient of agitating influences the combined effects of which may well appear insubordinate to any obvious laws it is likely that saturn is in a still earlier stage of planetary development than jupiter he is the lightest for his size of all the planets in fact he would float in water and since his density is shown by the amount of his equatorial bulging to increase centrally it follows that his superficial materials must be of a specific gravity so low as to be inconsistent on any probable supposition with the solid or liquid states moreover the chief arguments in favor of the high temperature of jupiter apply with increased force to saturn so that it may be concluded without much risk of error that a large proportion of his bulky globe seventy three thousand miles in diameter is composed of heated vapors kept in active and agitated circulation by the process of cooling his unique set of appendages has since the middle of the last century formed the subject of searching and fruitful inquiries both theoretical and telescopic the mechanical problem of the stability of saturn's rings was left by laplace in a very unsatisfactory condition considering them as rotating solid bodies he pointed out that they could not maintain their position unless their weight were in some way unsymmetrically distributed but made no attempt to determine the kind or amount of irregularity needed to secure this end some observations by herschel gave astronomers an excuse for taking for granted the fulfilment of the condition thus vaguely postulated and the question remained in abeyance until once more brought prominently forward by the discovery of the dusky ring in eighteen fifty the younger bond led the way among modern observers in denying the solidity of the structure the fluctuations in its aspect were he asserted in eighteen fifty one inconsistent with such a hypothesis the fine dark lines of division frequently detected in both bright rings and as frequently relapsing into imperceptibility were due in his opinion to the real nobility of the particles and indicated a fluid formation professor benjamin pierce of harvard university immediately followed with a demonstration on abstract grounds of their non-solidity streams of some fluid denser than water were he maintained the physical reality giving rise to the anomalous appearance 
first disclosed by Galileo's telescope. The mechanism of Saturn's rings, proposed as the subject of the Adams Prize, was dealt with by James Clerk Maxwell in 1857. His investigation forms the groundwork of all that is at present known in the matter. Its upshot was to show that neither solid nor fluid rings could continue to exist, and that the only possible composition of the system was by an aggregated multitude of unconnected particles, each revolving independently in a period corresponding to its distance from the planet. The idea of a satellite formation had been, remarkably enough, several times entertained and lost sight of. It was first put forward by Roberval in the 17th century, and again by Jacques Cassini in 1715, and with perfect definiteness by Wright of Durham in 1750. Little heed, however, was taken of these casual anticipations of a truth, which reappeared a virtual novelty as the legitimate outcome of the most refined modern methods. The details of telescopic observation accord on the whole admirably with this hypothesis the displacements or disappearance of secondary dividing lines the singular striated appearance first remarked by short in the eighteenth century last by periton and lockyer at nice march eighteenth eighteen eighty four show the effects of waves of disturbance traversing a moving mass of gravitating particles the broken and changing line of the planet's shadow on the ring gives evidence of variety in the planes of the orbits described by those particles the whole ring system too appears to be somewhat elliptical end of chapter eight part three chapter eight of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clerke. Part 2. Chapter 8. Planets and Satellites Continued. Part 4. The satellite theory has derived unlooked-for support from photometric inquiries. Professor Seligler pointed out in 1888 that the unvarying brilliancy of the outer rings under all angles of illumination from zero degrees to thirty degrees can be explained from no other point of view. Nor does the constitution of the obscure inner ring offer any difficulty, for it is doubtless formed of similar small bodies to those aggregated in the lucid members of the system only much more thinly strewn, and reflecting, consequently, much less light. It is not, indeed, at first easy to see why these sparser flights should show as a dense dark shading on the body of Saturn. Yet this is invariably the case. The objection has been urged by Professor Hastings of Baltimore. The brightest parts of these appendages, he remarked, are more lustrous than the globe they encircle. But if the inner ring consists of identical materials, possessing, presumably, an equal reflective capacity, the mere fact of their scanty distribution would not cause them to show as dark against the same globe. Professor Ziegler, however, replied that the darkening is due to the never-ending swarms of their separate shadows transiting the planet's disk. Sunlight is not, indeed, wholly excluded. Many rays come and go between the open ranks of the meteorites, for the dusky ring is transparent. The planet it encloses shows through it, as if veiled with a strip of crepe. A beautiful illustration of its quality in this respect was derived by Professor Barnard from an eclipse of Japetus, November 1, 1889. The eighth moon remained steadily visible during its passage through the shadow of the inner ring but with a progressive loss of luster in approaching its bright neighbor. There was no breach of continuity. The satellite met no gap. 
corresponding to that between the dusky ring and the body of saturn through which it could shine with undiminished light but was slowly lost sight of as it plunged into deeper and deeper gloom the important facts were thus established that the brilliant and obscure rings merge into each other and that the latter thins out towards the saturnian globe the meteoric constitution of these appendages was beautifully demonstrated in eighteen ninety five by professor keeler then director of the allegheny observatory pittsburgh from spectrographs taken with the slit adjusted to coincidence with the equatorial plane of the system he determined the comparative radial velocities of its different parts and these supply a crucial test of clerk maxwell's theory for if the rings were solid, the swiftest rates of rotation should be at their outer edges, corresponding to wider circles described in the same period, while, if they are pulverulent, the inverse relation must hold good. This proved to be actually the case. The motion slowed off outward in agreement with a diminishing speed of particles traveling freely, each in its own orbit. Keeler's result was promptly confirmed by Campbell, as well as by Delisandres and Bilopolsky. A question of singular interest, and one which cannot refrain from putting to ourselves, is whether we see in the rings of Saturn a finished structure, destined to play a permanent part in the economy of the system, or whether they represent merely a stage in the process of development out of the chaotic state in which it is impossible to doubt that the materials of all planets were originally merged. Mr. Otto Struver attempted to give a definite answer to this important query. A study of earlier and later records of observations disclosed to him, in 1851, an apparent progressive approach of the inner edge of the bright ring to the planet. The rate of approach he estimated at about 57 English miles a year, or 11,000 miles during the 194 years elapsed since the time of Huygens. Were it to continue, a collapse of the system must be far advanced within three centuries. But was the change real or illusory? A plausible but deceptive inference from insecure data. Mr. Struve resolved to put it to the test. A set of elaborately careful micrometrical measures of the dimensions of Saturn's rings executed by himself at Polkova in autumn of 1851 was provided as a standard of future comparison, and he was enabled to renew them under closely similar circumstances in 1882. But the expected diminution of the space between Saturn's globe and his rings had not taken place a slight extension in the width of the system both outward and inward was indeed hinted at and it is worth notice that just such a separation of the rings was indicated by clerk maxwell's theory so that there is an a priori likelihood of its being in progress yet hall's measures in eighteen eighty four through eighteen eighty seven failed to supply evidence of alteration with time and Barnard's, executed at Lick in 1894 through 1895, showed no sensible divergence from them. Hence, much weight cannot be laid upon Huygens's drawings and descriptions, which had been held to prove conclusively a partial filling up since 1657 of the interval between the ring and the planet. The rings of Saturn replace, in Professor G. H. Darwin's view, an abortive satellite scattered by tidal action into annular form for they lie closer to the planet than is consistent with the integrity of a revolving body of reasonable bulk the limit of possible existence for such a mass was fixed by rocha of montpelier in eighteen forty eight at two point forty four mean radii of its primary while the outer edge of the ring system is distant 2.38 radii of Saturn from his center. The virtual discovery of its pulverulent condition dates then, according to Professor Darwin, from 1848. 
he conjectures that the appendage will eventually disappear partly through the dispersal of its constituent particles inward and their subsidence upon the planet's surface partly by their dispersal outward to a region beyond roach's limit where coalescence might proceed unhindered by the strain of unequal attractions one modest satellite revolving inside mimus would then be all that was left of the singular appurtenances we now contemplate with admiration there seems reason to admit that kirkwood's law of commensurability has had some effect in bringing about the present distribution of the matter composing them here the influential bodies are saturn's moons while the divisions and boundaries of the rings represent the spaces where their disturbing action conspires to eliminate revolving particles kirkwood in fact showed in eighteen sixty seven that a body circulating in the chasm between the bright rings known as cassini's division would have a period nearly commensurable with those of four out of the eight moons and meyer of geneva subsequently calculated all such combinations with the result of bringing out coincidences between regions of maximum perturbation and the limiting and dividing lines of the system this is in itself a strong confirmation of the view that the rings are made up of independently revolving small bodies on december seventh eighteen seventy six professor asaph hall discovered at washington a bright equatorial spot on saturn which he followed and measured through above sixty rotations each performed in ten hours fourteen minutes twenty four seconds this he was careful to add represented the period not necessarily of the planet but only of the individual spot the only previous determination of saturn's axial movement setting aside some insecure estimates by schroeder was herschel's in seventeen ninety four giving a period of ten hours sixteen minutes the substantial accuracy of hall's result was verified by mr denning in eighteen ninety one in may and june of that year ten vague bright markings near the equator were watched by mr stanley williams who derived from them a rotation period only two seconds shorter than that determined at washington nevertheless similarly placed spots gave in eighteen ninety two and eighteen ninety three notably quicker rates so that the task of timing the general drift of the saturnian surface by the displacements of such objects is hampered to an indefinite extent by their individual proper motions saturn's outermost satellite japetus is markedly variable so variable that it sends us when brightest just four and a half times as much light as when faintest moreover its fluctuations depend upon its orbital position in such a way as to make it a conspicuous telescopic object when west a scarcely discernible one when east of the planet herschel's inference of a partially obscured globe turning always the same face towards its primary seems the only admissible one and is confirmed by pickering's measurements of the varying intensity of its light he remarked further that the dusky and brilliant hemispheres must be so posited as to divide the disk viewed from saturn into nearly equal parts so that this saturnian moon even when full appears very imperfectly illuminated over one half of its surface zollner estimated the albedo of saturn at zero point fifty one Müller at point eighty eight a value impossibly high considering that the spectrum includes no vestige of original emissions closely similar to that of jupiter it shows the distinctive dark line in the red wavelength 618 which we may call the red star line and jansen from the summit of etna in 1867 found traces in it of aqueous absorption the light from the ring appears to be pure reflected sunshine unmodified by original atmospheric action uranus when favorably situated can easily be seen with the naked eye as a star between the fifth and sixth magnitudes 
there is indeed some reason to suppose that he had been detected as a wandering orb by savage watchers of the skies in the pacific long before he swam into herschel's ken nevertheless inquiries into his physical habitudes are still in an early stage they are exceedingly difficult of execution even with the best and largest modern telescopes and their results remain clouded with uncertainty it will be remembered that uranus presents the unusual spectacle of a system of satellites travelling nearly at right angles to the plane of the ecliptic the existence of this anomaly gives a special interest to investigations of his axial movement which might be presumed from the analogy of the other planets to be executed in the same tilted plane yet this is far from being certainly the case mr buffum in eighteen seventy through eighteen seventy two caught traces of bright markings on the uranian disk doubtfully suggesting a rotation in about twelve hours in a plane not coincident with that in which his satellites circulate dusky bands resembling those of jupiter but very faint were barely perceptible to professor young at princeton in eighteen eighty three yet though almost necessarily inferred to be equatorial they made a considerable angle with the trend of the satellite's orbits more distinctly by the brothers henry with the aid of their fine refractor two gray parallel rulings separated by a brilliant zone were discerned every clear night at paris from january to june eighteen eighty four what were taken to be the polar regions appeared comparatively dusky the direction of the equatorial rulings for so we may safely call them, made an angle of 40 degrees with the satellite's line of travel. Similar observations were made at Nice by Messrs. Perrotin and Tholen, March to June 1884, a lucid spot near the equator, in addition, indicating rotation in a period of about 10 hours. The discrepancy was, however, considerably reduced by Perrotin's study of the planet in 1889 with the new 30-inch equatorial. The dark bands thus viewed to better advantage than in 1884 appeared to deviate no more than 10% from the satellite's orbit plane. No definitive results, on the other hand, were derived by Professors Holden, Schaeberl, and Keeler from their observations of Uranus in 1889 through 1890, with the potent instrument on Mount Hamilton. Shadings, it is true, were almost always, though faintly seen, but they appeared under an anomalous, possibly an illusory aspect. They consisted not of parallel, but of forked bands. Measurements of the little sea-green disk, which represents to us the massive bulk of Uranus, by Young, Schiaparelli, Safarik, H. C. Wilson, and Perrotin, prove it to be quite distinctly bulged. The compression at once caught Barnard's trained eye in 1894, when he undertook at Lick a micrometrical investigation of the system, and he was surprised to perceive that the major axis of the elliptical surface made an angle of about 28 degrees with the line of travel pursued by the satellites. Nothing more can be learned on this curious subject for some years, since the pole of the planet is now just turned nearly towards the earth, but Barnard's conclusion is unlikely to be seriously modified. He fixed the mean diameter of Uranus at 34,900 miles, but this estimate was materially reduced through Dr. C.'s elimination of irradiative effects by means of daylight measures executed at Washington in 1901. The visual spectrum of this planet was first examined by Father Seshi in 1869, and later with more advantages for accuracy by Huggins, Vogel, and Keeler. It is a very remarkable one. In lieu of the reflected Freundhofer lines, imperceptible, perhaps through feebleness of light, six broad bands of original absorption appear, one corresponding to the blue-green ray of hydrogen, another to be red star line of Jupiter and Saturn, the rest as yet unidentified. 
the hydrogen band seems much too strong and diffuse to be the mere echo of a solar line and might accordingly be held to imply the presence of free hydrogen in the iranian atmosphere this however would be difficult of reconcilement with keeler's identification of an absorption group in the yellow with telluric water band notwithstanding its high albedo zero point six two according to zollner proof is wanting that any of the light of uranus is inherent mr albert taylor announced indeed in eighteen eighty nine his detection with cummins giant reflector of bright flutings in its spectrum but professor keeler's examination proved them to be merely contrast effects sir william and lady huggins moreover obtained about the same time a photograph purely solar in character the spectrum it represented was crossed by numerous Fraunhofer lines and by no others it was then presumably composed entirely of reflected light judging from the indications of an almost evanescent spectrum neptune as regards physical condition is the twin of uranus as saturn of jupiter of the circumstances of his rotation we are as good as completely ignorant mr maxwell hall indeed noticed at jamaica in november and december eighteen eighty three certain rhythmical fluctuations of brightness suggesting revolution on an axis in slightly less than eight hours but professor pickering reduces the supposed variability to an amount altogether too small for certain perception and dr g merla denies its existence in toto it is true their observations were not precisely contemporaneous with those of mr hall who believes the partial obscurations recorded by himself to have been of a passing kind and to have suddenly ceased after a fortnight of prevalence their less conspicuous renewal was visible to him in november eighteen eighty four confirming a rotation period of seven point ninety two hours it was ascertained at first by indirect means that the orbit of neptune's satellite is inclined about twenty degrees to his equator mr marth having drawn attention to the rapid shifting of its plane of motion mr tisserand and professor newcomb independently published the conclusion that such shifting necessarily results from neptune's ellipsoidal shape the movement is of the kind exemplified although with inverted relations in the precession of the equinoxes the pole of the satellite owing to the pull of neptune's equatorial protuberance describes a circle around the pole of his equator in a retrograde direction and in a period of over five hundred years the amount of compression indicated for the primary body is at the outside one eighty fifth whence it can be inferred that neptune possesses a lower rotary velocity than the other giant planets direct verification of the trend theoretically inferred for the satellite's movement was obtained by dr c in eighteen ninety nine the Washington 26-inch refractor disclosed to him, under exceptionally favorable conditions, a set of equatorial belts on the disk of Neptune, and they took just the direction prescribed by theory. Their objective reality cannot be doubted, although Barnard was unable, either with the Lick or the Yerkes telescope, to detect any definitive markings on this planet its diameter was found by him to be thirty two thousand nine hundred miles the possibility that neptune may not be the most remote body circling round the sun has been contemplated ever since he has been known to exist within the last few years the position at a given epoch of a planet far beyond his orbital verge has been approximately fixed by two separate investigators Professor George Forbes of Edinburgh adopted in 1880 a novel plan of search for unknown members of the solar system, the first idea of which was thrown out by Mr. Flammarion in November 1879. It depends upon the movements of comets. It is well known that those of moderately short periods are, for a reason already explained, connected with the larger planets in such a way that the cometary aphelia fall near some planetary orbit 
jupiter claims a large retinue of such partial dependents neptune owns six and there are two considerable groups the farthest distances of which from the sun lie respectively near one hundred and three hundred times that of the earth at each of these vast intervals one involving a period of one thousand the other of five thousand years professor forbes maintains that an unseen planet circulates he even computed elements for the nearer of the two and fixed its place on the celestial sphere but the photographic searches made for it by dr roberts at crowborough and by mr wilson at daramona proved unavailing undeterred by dykemuller's discouraging opinion that cometary orbits extending beyond the recognized bounds of the solar system are too imperfectly known to serve as the basis of trustworthy conclusions the edinburgh professor returned to the attack in nineteen o one he now sought to prove that the lost comet of 1556 actually returned in 1844, but with the elements so transformed by ultra-Neptunian perturbations as to have escaped immediate identification. If so, the wanted planet has just entered the sign Libra, and being larger than Jupiter, should be possible to find almost simultaneously with forbes professor todd set about groping for the same object by the help of a totally different set of indications adams approved method commended itself to him but the hypothetical divigations of neptune having scarcely yet had time to develop he was thrown back upon the residual errors of uranus they gave him a virtually identical situation for the new planet with that derived from the clustering of cometary aphelia yet its assigned distance was little more than half that of the nearer of professor forbes remote pair and it completed a revolution in three hundred and seventy five instead of a thousand years the agreement in them between the positions determined on separate grounds for the ultra-Neptunian traveller, was merely an odd coincidence. Nor can we be certain, until it is seen, that we have really got into touch with it. End of section 29All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo, San Clemente, California. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Theories of Planetary Evolution. Chapter 9. Theories of Planetary Evolution we cannot doubt that the solar system as we see it is the result of some process of growth that during innumerable ages the forces of nature were at work upon its materials blindly modeling them into the shape appointed for them from the beginning by omnipotent wisdom to set ourselves to inquire what that process was may be an audacity but it is a legitimate nay an inevitable one for man's implanted instinct to look before and after does not apply to his own little life alone, but regards the whole history of creation from the highest to the lowest, from the microscopic germ of an alga or fungus to the visible frame and furniture of the heavens. Kant considered that the inquiry into the mode of origin of the world was one of the easiest problems set by nature, but it cannot be said that his own solution of it was satisfactory. He, however, struck out in 1755 a track which thought still pursues. In his Allgemeine Naturgeschichte, the growth of sun and planets was traced from the cradle of a vast and formless mass of evenly diffused particles, and the uniformity of their movements was sought to be accounted for by the unvarying action of attractive and repulsive forces under the dominion of which their development was carried forward. 
in its modern form the nebular hypothesis made its appearance in seventeen ninety six it was presented by laplace with diffidence as a speculation unfortified by numerical buttresses of any kind yet with visible exultation at having as he thought penetrated the birth secret of our system he demanded indeed more in the way of postulates than kant had done he started with a sun ready-made and surrounded with a vast glowing atmosphere extending into space out beyond the orbit of the farthest planet and endowed with a slow rotatory motion as this atmosphere or nebula cooled it contracted and as it contracted its rotation by a well-known mechanical law became accelerated at last a point arrived when tangential velocity at the equator increased beyond the power of gravity to control and equilibrium was restored by the separation of a nebulous ring revolving in the same period as the generating mass after a time the ring broke up into fragments all eventually reunited in a single revolving and rotating body this was the first and farthest planet meanwhile the parent nebula continued to shrink and whirl quicker and quicker passing as it did so through successive crises of instability each resulting in and terminated by the formation of a planet at a smaller distance from the center and with a shorter period of revolution than its predecessor in these secondary bodies the same process was repeated on a reduced scale the birth of satellites ensuing upon their contraction or not according to circumstances saturn's ring it was added afforded a striking confirmation of the theory of annular separation and appeared to have survived in its original form in order to throw light on the genesis of the whole solar system while the four first discovered asteroids offered an example in which the debris of a shattered ring had failed to coalesce into a single globe this scene of cosmical evolution was a characteristic bequest from the eighteenth century to the nineteenth it possessed the self-sufficing symmetry and entireness appropriate to the ideas of a time of renovation when the complexity of nature was little accounted of in comparison with the imperious orderliness of the thoughts of man since its promulgation however knowledge has transgressed many boundaries and set at naught much ingenious theorizing how has it fared with laplace's sketch of the origin of the world it has at least not been discarded as a feat the groundwork of speculation on the subject is still furnished by it it is nevertheless admittedly inadequate of much that exists it gives no account or an erroneous one the march of events certainly did not everywhere even if it did anywhere follow the exact path prescribed for it yet modern science attempts to supplement but scarcely ventures to supersede it thought has in many directions been profoundly modified by mayer's and jewell's discovery in eighteen forty two of the equivalence between heat and motion its corollary was the grand idea of the conservation of energy now one of the cardinal principles of science this means that under the ordinary circumstances of observation the old maxim ex nihilo nihil fit applies to force as well as to matter the supplies of heat light electricity must be kept up or the stream will cease to flow the question of the maintenance of the sun's heat was thus inevitably raised and with the question of maintenance that of origin is indissolubly connected dr julius robert mayer a physician residing at heilbronn was the first to apply the new light to the investigation of what sir john herschel had termed the great secret he showed that if the sun were a body either simply cooling or in a state of combustion it must long since have gone out had an equal mass of coal been set alight four or five centuries after the building of the pyramid of cheops and kept burning at such a rate as to supply solar light and heat during the interim 
only a few cinders would now remain in lieu of our undiminished glorious orb. Mayer looked round for an alternative. He found it in the meteoric hypothesis of solar conservation. The importance in the economy of our system of the bodies known as falling stars was then, in 1848, beginning to be recognized. It was known that they revolved in countless swarms round the sun, that the earth daily encountered millions of them, and it was surmised that the cone of the zodiacal light represented their visible condensation towards the attractive center. From the zodiacal light, then, Mayer derived the store needed for supporting the sun's radiations. He proved that, by the stoppage of their motion through falling into the sun, bodies would evolve from 4,600 to 9,200 times as much heat, according to their ultimate velocity, as would result from the burning of equal masses of coal, their precipitation upon the sun's surface being brought about by the resisting medium observed to affect the revolutions of Enki's comet. There was, however, a difficulty. The quantity of matter needed to keep, by the sacrifice of its movement, the hearth of our system warm and bright would be very considerable. Mayer's lowest estimate put it at 94,000 billion kilograms per second, or a mass equal to that of our moon biannually. But so large an addition to the gravitating power of the sun would quickly become sensible in the movement of the bodies dependent upon him. Their revolutions would be notably accelerated. Mayer admitted that each year would be shorter than the previous one by a not insignificant fraction of a second, and postulated an unceasing waste of substance, such as Newton had supposed must accompany emission of the material corpuscles of light to neutralize continual reinforcement. Mayer's views obtained a very small share of publicity, and owned Mr. Waterston as their independent author in this country. The meteoric or dynamical theory of solar sustentation was expounded by him before the British Association in 1853. It was developed with his usual ability by Lord Kelvin in the following year. The inflow of meteorites, he remarked, is the only one of all conceivable causes of solar heat which we know to exist from independent evidence. We know it to exist, but we now also know it to be entirely insufficient. The supplies presumed to be contained in the zodiacal light would be quickly exhausted. A constant inflow from space would be needed to meet the demand. But if moving bodies were drawn into the sun at anything like the required rate, the air, even out here at ninety-three millions of miles distance, would be thick with them. The earth would be red-hot from their impacts. Geological deposits would be largely meteoric, to say nothing of the effects on the mechanism of the heavens. Lord Kelvin himself urged the inadmissibility of the extra-planetary theory of meteoric supply on the very tangible ground that, if it were true, the year would be shorter now, actually by six weeks, than at the opening of the Christian era. The intraplanetary supply, however, is too scanty to be anything more than a temporary makeshift. The meteoric hypothesis was naturally extended from the maintenance of the sun's heat to the formation of the bodies circling round him. The Earth, no less doubtless than the other planets, is still growing. Cosmical matter in the shape of falling stars and aerolites, to the amount adopting Professor Newton's estimate of 100 tons daily, is swept up by it as it pursues its orbital round. Inevitably, the idea suggested itself that this process of appropriation gives the key to the life history of our globe, and that the momentary streak of fire in the summer sky represents a feeble survival of the glowing hailstorm by which in old times it was fashioned and warmed. Mr. E. W. Braley supported this view of planetary production in 1864, and it has recommended itself to Haidinger, Helmholtz, Proctor, and Fay. But the negative evidence of geological deposits appears fatal to it.
the theory of solar energy now generally regarded as the true one was announced by helmholtz in a popular lecture in eighteen fifty four it depends upon the same principle of the equivalence of heat and motion which had suggested the meteoric hypothesis but here the movement surrendered and transformed belongs to the particles not of any foreign bodies but of the sun itself drawn together from a wide ambit by the force of their own gravity their fall towards the sun's centre must have engendered a vast thermal store of which four hundred and fifty three of four hundred and fifty four are computed to be already spent presumably however the stream of reinforcement is still flowing in the very act of parting with heat the sun develops a fresh stock his radiations in short are the direct result of shrinkage through cooling a diminution of the solar diameter by three hundred and eighty feet yearly would just suffice to cover the present rate of emission and would for ages remain imperceptible with our means of observation since after the lapse of six thousand years the lessening of angular size would scarcely amount to one second but the process though not terminated is strictly a terminable one in less than five million years the sun will have contracted to half its present bulk in seven million more it will be as dense as the earth it is difficult to believe that it will then be a luminous body nor can an unlimited past duration be admitted helmholtz considered that radiation might have gone on with its actual intensity for twenty-two langley allows only eighteen million years the period can scarcely be stretched by the most generous allowances to double the latter figure but this is far from meeting the demands of geologists and biologists an attempt was made in eighteen eighty one to supply the sun with machinery analogous to that of a regenerative furnace enabling it to consume the same fuel over and over again and so to prolong indefinitely its beneficent existence the inordinate waste of energy which shocks our thrifty ideas was simultaneously abolished the earth stops and turns variously to account one two thousand two hundred and fifty millionth part of the solar radiations each of the other planets and satellites takes a proportionate share the rest being all but an infinitesimal fraction of the whole is dissipated through endless space to serve what purpose we know not now on the late sir william seaman's plan this reckless expenditure would cease the solar incomings and outgoings would be regulated on approved economic principles and the inevitable final bankruptcy would be staved off to remote ages but there was a fatal flaw in its construction he imagined a perpetual circulation of combustible materials alternately surrendering and regaining chemical energy the round being kept going by the motive force of the sun's rotation this however was merely to perch the globe upon a tortoise while leaving the tortoise in the air the sun's rotation contains a certain definite amount of mechanical power enough according to lord kelvin if directly converted into heat to keep up the sun's emission during one hundred sixteen years and six days a mere moment in cosmical time more economically applied it would no doubt go farther its exhaustion would nevertheless under the most favorable circumstances ensue in a comparatively short period the other objections equally unanswerable have been urged to the regenerative hypothesis but this one suffices dr kroll's collision hypothesis is less demonstrably unsound but scarcely less unsatisfactory by the mutual impact of two dark masses rushing together with tremendous speed he sought to provide the solar nebula with an immense original stock of heat for the reinforcement of that subsequently evolved in the course of its progressive contraction the sun while still living on its capital would thus have a larger capital to live on and the time demands of the less exacting geologists and biologists might be successfully met but the primitive event assumed for the purpose of dispensing them from the inconvenience of hurrying up their phenomena is not one that a sane judgment can readily admit to have ever 
in point of actual fact, happened. There remains, then, as the only intelligible rationale of solar sustentation, Helmholtz's shrinkage theory. And this has a very important bearing upon the nebular view of planetary formation. It may, in fact, be termed its complement. For it involves the idea that the sun's materials, once enormously diffused, gradually condensed to their present volume with development of heat and light, and, it may plausibly be added, with the separation of dependent globes. The data furnished by spectrum analysis, too, favor the supposition of a common origin for sun and planets by showing their community of substance, while gaseous nebulae present examples of vast masses of tenuous vapor, such as our system may plausibly be conjectured to have primitively sprung from. But recent science raises many objections to the details, if it supplies some degree of confirmation to the fundamental idea of Laplace's cosmogony. The detection of the retrograde movement of Neptune's satellite made it plain that the anomalous conditions of the Uranian world were due to no extraordinary disturbance, but to a systematic variety of arrangement at the outskirts of the solar domain, so that, were a trans-Neptunian planet discovered, we should be fully prepared to find it rotating and surrounded by satellites circulating from east to west. The uniformity of movement, upon the probabilities connected with which the French geometer mainly based his scheme, thus at once vanishes. The excessively rapid revolution of the inner Martian moon is a further stumbling block. On Laplace's view, no satellite can revolve in a shorter time than its primary rotates, for in its period of circulation survives the period of rotation of the parent mass which filled the sphere of its orbit at the time of giving it birth, and rotation quickens as contraction goes on. Therefore, the older time of axial rotation should invariably be longer. This obstacle can, however, as we shall presently see, be turned. More serious is one connected with the planetary periods pointed out by Babinet in 1861. In order to make them fit in with the hypothesis of successive separation from a rotating and contracting body, certain arbitrary assumptions have to be made of fluctuations in the distribution of the matter forming that body at the various epochs of separation. Such expedients usually merit the distrust which they inspire. Primitive and permanent irregularities of density in the solar nebula, such as Miss Young's calculations suggest, do not, on the other hand, appear intrinsically improbable. Again, it was objected by Professor Kirkwood in 1869 that there could be no sufficient cohesion in such an enormously diffused mass as the planets are supposed to have sprung from to account for the wide intervals between them. The matter separated through the growing excess of centrifugal speed would have been cast off, not by rarely recurring efforts, but continually, fragmentarily, pari passu, with condensation and acceleration. Each wisp of nebula, as it found itself unduly hurried, would have declared its independence, and set about revolving and condensing on its own account. The result would have been a meteoric, not a planetary, system. Moreover, it is a question whether the relative ages of the planets do not follow in order just the reverse of that concluded by Laplace. Professor Newcomb holds the opinion that the rings which eventually constituted the planets divided from the main body of the nebula almost simultaneously, priority, if there were any, being on the side of the inner and smaller ones, while in M. Fay's cosmogony, the retrograde motion of the systems formed by the two outer planets is ascribed, on grounds it is true of dubious validity, to their comparatively late origin. This ingenious scheme was designed not merely to complete, but to supersede that of Laplace, which undoubtedly, through the inclusion by our system of oppositely directed rotations, forfeits its claim simply and singly to account for the fundamental peculiarities of its structure. M. Fay's leading contention is that, under the circumstances assumed by Laplace, not the two outer planets alone, but the whole company must have been possessed of retrograde rotation. 
for they were formed, ex hypothesi, after the sun. Central condensation had reached an advanced stage when the rings they were derived from separated. The principle of inverse squares consequently held good, and Kepler's laws were in full operation. Now, particles circulating in obedience to these laws can only, since their velocity decreases outward from the center of attraction, coalesce into a globe with a backward axial movement. Nor was Laplace blind to this flaw in his theory, but his effort to remove it, though it passed muster for the best part of a century, was scarcely successful. His planet-forming rings were made to rotate all in one piece, their outer parts thus necessarily traveling at a swifter linear rate than their inner parts, and eventually uniting, equally of necessity, into a forward-spinning body. The strength of cohesion involved may, however, safely be called impossible, especially when it is considered that nebulous materials were in question. The reform proposed by M. Fay consists in admitting that all the planets inside Uranus are of pre-solar origin, that they took globular form in the bosom of a nearly homogeneous nebula, revolving in a single period, with motion accelerated from center to circumference, and hence agglomerating into masses with a direct rotation. Uranus and Neptune owed their exceptional characteristics to their later birth. When they came into existence, the development of the sun was already far advanced, central force had acquired virtually its present strength, unity of period had been abolished by its predominance, and motion was retarded outward. Thus, what we may call the relative chronology of the solar system is thrown once more into confusion. The order of seniority of the planets is now no easier to determine than who first, who last, among the victims of Hector's spear. For M. Fay's arrangements, notwithstanding the skill with which he has presented them, cannot be unreservedly accepted. The objections to them, thoughtfully urged by M. C. Wolfe and Professor Darwin, are grave. Not the least so is his omission to take account of an agency of change presently to be noticed. A further valuable discussion of the matter was published by M. de Ligondès in 1897. His views are those of Fay, modified to disarm the criticisms they had encountered, and special attention may be claimed for his weighty remark that each planet has a life history of its own, essentially distinct from those of the others, and, despite original unity, not to be confounded with them. The drift of recent investigations seems, indeed, to be to find the embryonic solar system already potentially complete in the parent nebula, like the oak in an acorn, and to regulate detailed explanations of its peculiarities to the dim pre-nebular foretime. We now come to a most remarkable investigation, one indeed unique in its profession to lead us back with mathematical certainty towards the origin of a heavenly body. We refer to Professor Darwin's inquiries into the former relations of the earth and moon. They deal exclusively with the effects of tidal friction, and primarily with those resulting not from oceanic, but from bodily tides, such as the sun and moon must have raised in past ages on a liquid or viscous earth. The immediate effect of either is, as already explained, to destroy the rotation of the body on which the tide is raised, as regards the tide-raising body, bringing it to turn always the same face towards its disturber. This, we can see, has been completely brought about in the case of the moon. There is, however, a secondary or reactive effect. Action is always mutual. Precisely as much as the moon pulls the terrestrial tidal wave backward, the tidal wave pulls the moon forward. But pulling a body forward in its orbit implies the enlargement of that orbit. In other words, the moon is, as a consequence of tidal friction, very slowly receding from the earth. This will go on, other circumstances remaining unchanged, until the lengthening day overtakes the more tardily lengthening month, when each month will be of about 1,400 hours. 
a position of what we may call tidal equilibrium between earth and moon will apart from disturbance by other bodies then be attained if however it be true that in the time to come the moon will be much farther from us it follows that in the time past she was much nearer to us than she now is tracing back her history by the aid of professor darwin's clue we at length find her revolving in a period of somewhere between two and four hours almost in contact with an earth rotating just at the same rate this was before tidal friction had begun its work of grinding down axial velocity and expanding orbital range but the position was not one of stable equilibrium the slightest inequality must have set on foot a series of uncompensated changes if the moon had whirled the least iota faster than the earth spun she must have been precipitated upon it her actual existence shows that the trembling balance inclined the other way by a second or two to begin with the month exceeded the day the tidal wave crept ahead of the moon tidal friction came into play and our satellite started on its long spiral journey outward from the parent globe this must have occurred it is computed at least fifty-four million years ago that this kind of tidal reactive effect played its part in bringing the moon into its present position and is still to some slight extent at work in changing it there can be no doubt whatever an irresistible conjecture carried the explorer of its rigidly deducible consequences one step beyond them the moon's time of revolution when so near the earth as barely to escape contact with it must have been by kepler's law more than two and less than two and a half hours now it happens that the most rapid rate of rotation of a fluid mass of the earth's average density consistent with spheroidal equilibrium is two hours and twenty minutes quicken the movement but by one second and the globe must fly asunder hence the inference that the earth actually did fly asunder through overfast spinning the ensuing disruption representing the birth throes of the moon it is likely that the event was hastened or helped by solar tidal disturbance to recapitulate analysis tracks backward the two bodies until it leaves them in very close contiguity one rotating and the other revolving in approximately the same time and that time certainly not far different from and quite possibly identical with the critical period of instability for the terrestrial spheroid is this professor darwin asks a mere coincidence or does it not rather point to the break-up of the primeval planet into two masses in consequence of a too rapid rotation we are tempted but are not allowed to give an unqualified assent mr james nolan of victoria has made it clear that the moon could not have subsisted as a continuous mass under the powerful disruptive strain which would have acted upon it when revolving almost in contact with the present surface of the earth and professor darwin admitting the objection concedes to our satellite in its initial stage the alternative form of a flock of meteorites but such a congregation must have been quickly dispersed by tidal action into a meteoric ring the same investigator subsequently fixed six thousand five hundred miles from center to center as the minimum distance at which the moon could have revolved in its entirety and he concluded it necessary to suppose that after the birth of a satellite if it takes place at all in this way a series of changes occur which are quite unknown the evidence however for the efficiency of tidal friction in bringing about the actual configuration of the lunar terrestrial system is not invalidated by this failure to penetrate its natal mystery under its influence the principal elements of that system fall into interdependent mutual relations it connects casually and quantitatively the periods of the moon's revolution and of the earth's rotation the obliquity of the ecliptic the inclination and eccentricity of the lunar orbit all this can scarcely be accidental 
Professor Darwin's first researches on this subject were communicated to the Royal Society, December 18, 1879. They were followed, January 20, 1881, by an inquiry on the same principles into the earlier condition of the entire solar system. The results were a warning against hasty generalization. They showed that the lunar terrestrial system, far from being a pattern for their development, was a singular exception among the bodies swayed by the sun. Its peculiarity resides in the fact that the moon is proportionately by far the most massive attendant upon any known planet. Its disturbing power over its primary is thus abnormally great, and tidal friction has, in consequence, played a predominant part in bringing their mutual relations into their present state. The comparatively late birth of the moon tends to ratify this inference. The dimensions of the earth did not differ, according to our present authority, very greatly from what they now are when her solitary offspring came, somehow, into existence. This is found not to have been the case with any other of the planets. It is unlikely that the satellites of Jupiter, Saturn, or Mars, we may safely add of Uranus or Neptune, ever revolved in much narrower orbits than those they now traverse. It is practically certain that they did not, like our moon, originate very near the present surfaces of their primaries. What follows? The tide-raising power of a body grows with vicinity in a rapidly accelerated ratio. Lunar tides must then have been on an enormous scale when the moon swung round at a fraction of its actual distance from the earth. But no other satellite with which we are acquainted occupied at any time a corresponding position. Hence, no other satellite ever possessed tide-raising capabilities in the least comparable to those of the moon. We conclude, once more, that tidal friction had an influence here very different from its influence elsewhere. Quite possibly, however, that influence may be more nearly spent than in less advanced combinations of revolving globes. Mr. Nolan concluded in 1895 that it still retains appreciable efficacy in the several domains of the outer planets. The moons of Jupiter and Saturn are, by his calculations, in course of sensible retreat, under compulsion of the perennial ripples raised by them on the surfaces of their gigantic primaries. He thus connects the interior position of the fifth Jovian satellite with its small mass. The feebleness of its tide-raising power obliged it to remain behind its companions, for there is no sign of its being more juvenile than the Galilean quartet. The yielding of plastic bodies to the strain of unequal attractions is a phenomenon of far-reaching consequence. We know that the sun as well as the moon causes tides in our oceans. There must, then, be solar, no less than lunar, tidal friction. The question at once arises, what part has it played in the development of the solar system? Has it ever been one of the leading importance, or has its influence always been, as it now is, subordinate, almost negligible? To this, too, Professor Darwin supplies an answer. It can be stated, without hesitation, that the sun did not give birth to the planets, as the earth has been supposed to have given birth to the moon, by the disruption of its already condensed, though viscous and glowing mass, pushing them then gradually backward from its surface into their present places. For the utmost possible increase in the length of the year through tidal friction is one hour, and five minutes is a more probable estimate. So far as the pull of tide waves raised on the sun by the planets is concerned, then, the distances of the latter have never been notably different from what they now are, though that cause may have converted the paths traversed by them from circles into ellipses. Over their physical history, however, it was probably in a large measure influential. The first vital issue for each of them was, satellites or no satellites, were they to be governors as well as governed, or should they revolve in sterile isolation throughout the eons of their future existence? Here there is strong reason to believe that solar tidal friction was the overruling power. It is remarkable that planetary fecundity increases, at least so far outward as Saturn, 
with distance from the sun can these two facts be in any way related in other words is there any conceivable way by which tidal influence could prevent or impede the throwing off of secondary bodies we have only to think for a moment in order to see that this is precisely one of its direct results tidal friction whether solar or lunar tends to reduce the axial movement of the body it acts upon but the separation of satellites depends according to the received view upon the attainment of a disruptive rate of rotation hence if solar tidal friction were strong enough to keep down the pace below this critical point the contracting mass would remain intact there would be no satellite production this in all probability actually occurred in the case both of mercury and venus they cooled without dividing because the solar friction break applied to them was too strong to permit acceleration to pass the limit of equilibrium the complete destruction of their relative axial movement has been rendered probable by recent observations and that the process went on rapidly is a reasonable further inference the earth barely escaped the fate of loneliness incurred by her neighbors her first and only epoch of instability was retarded until she had nearly reached maturity the late appearance of the moon accounts for its large relative size through the increased cohesion of an already strongly condensed parent mass and for the distinctive peculiarities of its history and influence on the producing globe solar tidal friction although it did not hinder the formation of two minute dependents of mars has been invoked to explain the anomalously rapid revolution of one of them phobos we have seen completes more than three revolutions while mars rotates once but this was probably not always so the two periods were originally nearly equal the difference it is alleged was brought about by tidal waves raised by the sun on the semi-fluid spheroid of mars rotatory velocity was thereby destroyed the martian day slowly lengthened and as a secondary consequence the period of the inner satellite become shorter than the augmented day began progressively to diminish so that phobos unlike our moon was in the beginning farther from its primary than now but here again mr nolan entered a caveat applying the simple test of numerical evaluation he showed that before solar tidal friction could lengthen the rotation period of mars by so much as one minute phobos should have been precipitated upon its surface for the enormous disparity of mass between it and the sun is so far neutralized by the enormous disparity in their respective distances from mars that solar tidal force there is only fifty times that of the little satellite but the tidal effects of a satellite circulating quicker than its primary rotates exactly reverse those of one moving like our moon comparatively slowly so that the tides raised by phobos tend to shorten both periods its orbital momentum however is so extremely small in proportion to the rotational momentum of mars that any perceptible inroad upon the latter is attended by a lavish and ruinous expenditure of the former it is as if a man owning a single five-pound note were to play for equal stakes with a man possessing a million the bankruptcy sure to ensure is typified by the coming fate of the martian inner satellite the catastrophe of its fall needs to bring it about only a very feeble reactive pull compared with the friction which the sun should apply in order to protract the martian day by one minute and from the proportionate strength of the forces at work it is quite certain that one result cannot take place without the other nor can things have been materially different in the past hence the idea must be abandoned that the primitive time of rotation of mars survives in the period of its inner satellite the anomalous shortness of the latter may however in m wolf's opinion be explained by the trainis elliptiques with which brochet supplemented nebular annulation these are traced back to the descent of separating strata from the shoulders of the great nebulous spheroid towards its equatorial plane 
their rotational velocity being thus relatively small, they formed inner rings, very much nearer to the center of condensation than would have been possible on the unmodified theory of Laplace. Phobos might, in this view, be called a polar offset of Mars, and the rings of Saturn are thought to own a similar origin. Outside the orbit of Mars, solar tidal friction can scarcely be said to possess at present any sensible power, but it is far from certain that this was always so. It seems not unlikely that its influence was the overruling one in determining the direction of planetary rotation. Monsieur Fay, as we have seen, objected to Laplace's scheme that only retrograde secondary systems could be produced by it. In this he was anticipated by Kirkwood, who, however, supplied an answer to his own objection. Sun-raised tides must have acted with great power on the diffused masses of the embryo planets. By their means they doubtless very soon came to turn, in lunar fashion, the same hemisphere always towards their center of motion. This amounts to saying that even if they started with retrograde rotation, it was, by solar tidal friction, quickly rendered direct. For it is scarcely necessary to point out that a planet turning an invariable face to the sun rotates in the same direction in which it revolves and in the same period. As, with the progress of condensation, tides became feebler and rotation more rapid, the accelerated spinning necessarily proceeded in the sense thus prescribed for it. Hence, the backward axial movements of Uranus and Neptune may very well be a survival, due to the inefficiency of solar tides at their great distance, of a state of things originally prevailing universally throughout the system. The general outcome of Mr. Darwin's researches has been to leave Laplace's cosmogony untouched. He concludes nothing against it, and, what perhaps tells with more weight in the long run, has nothing to substitute for it. In one form or the other, if we speculate at all on the development of the planetary system, our speculations are driven into conformity with the broad lines of the nebular hypothesis, to the extent, at least, of admitting an original material unity and motive uniformity. But we can see now, better than formerly, that these supply a bare and imperfect sketch of the truth. We should err gravely were we to suppose it possible to reconstruct, with the help of any knowledge our race is ever likely to possess, the real and complete history of our admirable system. The subtlety of nature, Bacon says, transcends in many ways the subtlety of the intellect and senses of man. By no mere barren formula of evolution, indiscriminately applied all round, the results we marvel at, and by a fragment of which our life is conditioned, were brought forth. But by the manifold play of interacting forces, variously modified and variously prevailing, according to the local requirements of the design, they were appointed to execute. End of Part 2, Chapter 9, Theories of Planetary Evolution Recording by Aaron Carlo, San Clemente, California